talking of US dollar 10 million in value coming out of India. Special thanks to leaders who have joined the panel today. I would like to share with you uh, that, uh, that as you talk today, there will be at least 80 medical doctors who are engaged in developing advanced clinical nutrition. They will be inspired by listening to you and that will help them develop their intellectual <clears throat> property products in the field of responsible nutrition. For many people, a healthy lifestyle means more than eating a good diet and getting nutraceuticals has now become part of their health plan. But though there's much publicity about their potential benefit, there's less awareness of possible harmful effects. In fact, using these products can land you in adverse health condition. Recently, a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine found that adverse effects of nutraceuticals were responsible for an average of 23,000 emergency department visits per year. And that's a lot of number for something that is supposed to be good for you. At Nutrifying Your Root, we along with leaders like the panelists today would love to work closely in closing the loops, loopholes and ensuring a meaningful health outcomes. Under your leadership, Nutraceuticals can emerge as a therapy completers from being optional adjuvants left for the patients and consumers to take their own uninformed choices. There's a lot for us to collaborate to make sure that India emerges as a responsible nutrition evidence-based nutraceutical hub. I would now like to invite the chairperson of Nutrify Root, Dr. Ezel Arasan, to take the session forward and Look forward to a very interesting session with the leading panelists. Dr. Arasan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amit. Um, uh, thank you, uh, eminent speakers and the panelists here. This is a wonderful uh, opportunity for us to um, bring out the scientific and the academic uh, facts and research findings of nutrition and the kind of work that Indian uh, medical scientists are doing uh, so this is a great session and I have been asking Dr. Professor Yadnik for his time for over three months and I'm successful that today I could get his time. So uh, I, I take a great pleasure in uh, welcoming um, all of you here. And today is one of the most significant days, you know, where we have uh, the president of Indian Medical Association, where there are 450,000 members. The president, national president, is present here, Professor Jailal, and uh, president of uh, Indian Association of Pediatrics, that the mightiest specialist force. He also has kindly consented to participate in the panel discussion. More from a continuation of what Professor Yadnik will be speaking, and uh, backed up by scientists, medical scientists, and uh, thought leaders policy makers like Professor Rajiv Tendon and uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan. It's a wonderful uh, group of panelists. Thank you very much. I request uh, Professor Jailal. Uh, Professor Jailal, just to briefly introduce him. He needs no introduction. He is so very well known nationally, all over. Uh, Professor Jailal is a surgeon, uh, eminent surgeon. He's an MS from Stanley Medical College and uh, he's a fellow of Royal College of uh, Surgeons. And uh, he has numerous fellowships across the globe and numerous authorships, numerous publications, numerous uh, lectures. In addition to it, he's socially very active. He has been, he has almost dedicated his life to Indian Medical Association. And he has done a lot for the Indian Medical Association and the fraternity of uh, medical people. Uh, I take great pleasure. It is in, in fact a great boon to have uh, Professor Jailal here uh, to inaugurate this session. He has, uh, he didn't have much time. I said, just at least speak for three, four minutes or five minutes, right? And uh, please inaugurate the session. So I take great pleasure, sir, in welcoming you. Please, without wasting time, sir, I hand over the session to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Lillerson, sir. Uh, beloved and distinguished chairperson of this Nutrify India Road Association, 
organization, Dr. Elil, within Dr. Amit, uh, by the very distinguished leader of Indian Association of Pediatrics, Dr. Bakul Pari, the distinguished uh, professor of uh, diabetes in the KEM unit and uh, great scientist, Dr. Chitranjan Yajni, the officials and the, the professors which are leading the Nutrition India Network of uh, programs, Dr. Radha Krishnan sir and Dr. Rajit Tendon, and distinguished members of this uh, field. I'm extremely delighted to be part of this. Uh, Indian Medical Association formally believes in our social responsibility. I'm so much uh, impressed by the statement of your uh, Dr. Amit. He said it is uh, a responsible nutritional capacity building is the motto of this organization. That is what we uh, literally need today. Uh, the concept of nutrition is mainly focused on the uh, macronutrients, but many times the people miss the importance and the vitality of the micronutrients. Uh, I'm sure that for the, all the public, we know that micronutrients needs to be supplemented. It cannot be produced by our own body. So we need to have either it's a, a, a source of a natural source or a supplementary source for these micronutrients. So uh, there are so many uh, uh, pharmaceutical agents are coming in and portraying these micronutrient supplementation, but we need to have a, a responsible evidence-based organization which will be able to help the public in understanding the intricacy of that and doing the much research on that and promoting the research concept and making it uh, Indianized or the cultural-based or the community-based a pharmaceutical program. Uh, just for an example, if we say the vitamin D is a micronutrient which is needed and just an exposure to sunlight is what we needed. But many times in the modern era where we are exposed to the various kinds of the sophisticated equipments of AC room or the non-exposure to sunlight, and we are now seeing that many people with the vitamin deficiency. And we recently conducted a study in, an, uh, in a college where we found it was an, a college in a metropolitan city 82% of the women in that college are anemic. That is a, a nutritional deficit. And as a surgeon, we know that iron deficiency, any iron deficiency, iodine deficiency, thyroid problem is. The most importantly, what we, the research is coming into that, if that micronutrients are not adequately supplied in the in utero, that is resulting in a generation with a diabetogenicity or obesity and other complicated complications on that. So this is very, very important arena where we need to serve for our future citizens of this country. When we talk about the pediatric age group and if we can prevent something, and that is the greatest service we are doing to the country. Then all our knowledge, all our education and all our uh, research which we are doing, if it is focused on preventing something and empowering our uh, children who are going to born in this country with the nutritionally fit and emotionally stable people, and that will be the great service which you are going to do the country. But my only appeal to the organization is uh, whenever we talk on the nutrition, the pharmaceutical event, and that the cost in fact uh, is going to be a big one. If I ask somebody to give it some B complex or vitamin tablets, they are very happy to do. But when we ask someone to eat the cabbage, when we ask them to eat and yield, or ask them to eat the nutritionally naturally available food, the hesitancy is there in the people because we always think something is fortified something is glorified, something is sold for a higher price is always uh, a cost, I mean, uh, more effective. So that, uh, uh, I, I request my appeal on behalf of IMA to the neutral life. It is not only that you are producing, but you must also serve something on health awareness to the community in which is what is exactly that they need and what, how best they can do it under room setup or their natural setup. And always the nature is great and whatever the nature provides the locality, and the nearby that uh, area is much more important, whatever we are importing or whatever we are manufacturing. If they can uh, get adjusted to the natural life, they can adjust it to the what is available nearer to their house. And that is going to be the most important thing. So the, much more than the producing that I feel personally, the awareness creating on the nutrition is most important, especially when we talk about that uh, micronutrients and uh, GDM, the gestational diabetes mellitus. And it, still it has been a, a big question, but uh, making a diagnosis of GDM itself is a big problem. And when we say that the antenatal care is not able to adequately reach the our own community people in many rural areas, and many times we get people come in the full time delivery, full time pregnancy to for, for delivery. So the, we need to empower 
the uh, general practitioners we need to empower our uh, public we need to empower not only the people who are involved in the medical field but also the involved in the people of other social organization because i firmly believe the non I mean the communicable diseases cannot be managed only by the doctor population it has to be melt with the societies like a nutrition network of india breastfeeding network of india and so many rotary lines and all these organization has a role to play in this uh, uh, i mean red i mean uh, reducing the impact of the nda especially the habit of uh, adequate nutrition habit of adequate exercise habit of avoiding smoking habit of avoiding alcohol these principles has to be taught to our public but in their uh, socially responsible organization so i i am so extremely happy that you have taken this topic of micronutrients especially on this field and the, the eminent speakers are going to talk about the diversity or the propensity with which the in vitro complications are going to create this diversity in our country how best we will be able to prevent and i am so happy to hear that nutrify india is able to bring in lot of foreign uh, currency to india to uh, empower our scientists and our doctors to produce an appropriate uh, Uh, capacity building on the nutrition field so i wish and hope and your your journey will continue and you will make our india a nutritionally rich and emotionally stable country and uh, a healthy country and that is a dream of every organization every association so i am may wholeheartedly support this venture of your uh, vision to capacity building on the nutrition in india so whatever help you need in a massive massive level and especially on empowering our general practitioners on this uh, micronutrient concept ima is willing to coordinate with you so we are looking forward to work with you to strengthen the the knowledge the skill and the availability of the micronutrient concept in india thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity it is nice to have the leading people and the uh, experts on this field so uh, once again i take this opportunity to congratulate dr elil uh, who was very passionate on this work and very passionately Uh, organizing this the meticulous planner meticulous organizer incidentally he is also our president of our uh, uh, kodambakam indian medical association branch so I, i i have every liberty to ask him to do more for indian medical association also through the ima and to serve the uh, concept of this micronutrients in our country thank you very much sure thank sir you. thank you so much thank you so much sir thank you yeah. very nice uh, that is a rock- excellent uh, inaugural speech sir uh i i thank you for that and let me take the pleasure of inviting professor yadnik to speak uh just to quickly introduce professor yadnik who is very well known globally uh he is the person who first described the thin fat indian right and uh, he you know anybody in the field of diabetes and endocrinology or nutrition the moment you say professor yadnik they will know he is a very soft spoken extraordinary gentleman and a man who is of you know tremendous academic insight and research insight he has contributed so much to the indian develop indian uh, nutritional science and in the field of endocrinology which includes diabetes as part of that uh, he he in fact uh, had brought out the role of vitamin d deficiency in india in a big way uh he has he has done so much of work in it would be very very difficult for me to you know narrate most of them you know you can you can even google out and see professor cy yadnik the moment you put in you will have you have a wikipedia page and then you, know, you have a number of uh, uh, number of publications numerous publications and he is recognized by the international diabetes federation no surprise about it he is recognized by international dohart society he is recognized by diabetes foundation india diabetes foundation by the nutritional society of india and he is also wanted advisor by the government of india biotech the department of biotechnology national institute of nutrition mm-hmm. and you name the big institutions they need his intelligence and wisdom sir i request you to speak and he is going to speak on the work that he has done a lot professor sir i hand over the session to you next 30 to 40 minutes as you please sir enlighten us thank you asan and thank you everybody thank you for inviting dignitaries on the dais nice meeting you and i have called the talk micronutrients and programming of diabetes 
and as we go i'll explain to you what programming is and diabetes is a combination of the two words diabetes and adiposity two very closely linked characteristics in the human beings which we are seeing today i come from km hospital pune and i always take a pride in saying my diabetes unit is the only one in the world whose logo is mother and baby and this is because of the firm belief i had when i started this unit 35 years ago that maternal health is a major driver of the fetal health not only in the intrauterine life but for the rest of the life later on we had this new modern ganesh as our second logo and you can see this modern ganesh instead of traveling on the back of this mouse which it used to do now clicks this four mice together and moves very fast on the internet there are all these modaks by his side and he is very happy relaxing on the couch that's the modern ganesh a rapidly progressing society where food and lack of physical activity have become a problem we have a whole lot of collaborators i have mentioned some here major one is professor barker's unit mrc environmental epidemiology unit in southampton so i am trained as a diabetologist and from my children sort of or my student days the dogma of diabetes is that the susceptibility is genetic and the precipitating factors are obesogenic and genetic susceptibility is a polygenic susceptibility it's not the mendelian type polygenic means very small contribution from many genes and a lot of environmental contribution which comes here and because at least today we can't do much about this susceptibility we say it's non modifiable so all the efforts at preventing and sometimes treating diabetes are all concentrated in this box you had just diet physical inactivity is corrected stress is reduced etc diabetes prevention programs have been running in different countries starting with finland and us in india famous dr ambadi ramchandran from madras started it that was his first diabetes prevention program in india in general the participants are adults average participant in all these trials was 55 year old in western world they are very obese bmi 34 this is from the diabetes prevention program of the world. and they all had impaired glucose tolerance which means pre diabetes or a glucose level which is not diabetes which is not normal a borderline glucose it's only semantic in other words they had elevated glucose and they were asked to eat less walk more that was the basic lifestyle advice and in some trials they used drugs like metformin or other drugs and they showed that over a period of 3 to 5 years there was less progression from impaired glucose tolerance to diabetes which lasted a few years but again many people sort of tip down into diabetes so it was not a permanent solution my problem with this model is that they call it primary prevention actually it is treatment of precipitating factors and at best we can call it secondary prevention early diagnosis and treatment we are dealing with three end stage conditions here older age higher bmi and higher glucose and what's more in all the trials the participants are post reproductive so even if we achieve something in them 
it's not going to go to their next generation and with this background i'll tell you how we have researched over the last 30 40 years to try and actually find causes which are proximal to what we deal with in the precipitating factors so the topic of my research always has been is there a non genetic modifiable susceptibility what dr hasan called a propensity and that is where dohad comes in this is a relatively new branch in medicine developmental origins of health and disease i am one of the founder members and now a trustee of the international dohad society i am also the president of indian dohad society which we call sneha society for natal effects on the health of adults and incidentally indian sneha is at least 10 years older than the international dohad society because triggered by dr parker we all form society before rest of the world took over so dohad is something which tries to bring us out of the genetics lifestyle conundrum which we have been paying lip service since our student days all of the dignitaries sort of are in the age group which i am 65 plus minus and we were taught this the dohad conundrum has come only last 12 15 to 20 years and textbooks are still a little bit shy of mentioning it so i wrote this article in 2008 to explain what dohad is and dohad starts from like say intergenerational influences shown here for maternal but also paternal and maternal size her metabolism her nutrition her stress and other environmental factors which operate on the fetus through mother like say pollution which comes from outside gets into mother and goes to the baby are all operating on the developing system they affect the basic genome by causing epigenetic changes and these today we know can be dna methylation changes in histone acetylation and various miRNAs so there is no change in the genomic sequence of bases but the outer layers of genome if we can call it can be modified and that affects the functioning of the genomes and that is where dohad works that is seen in fetal growth modification is development and differentiation and finally what we are able to see is the birth phenotype either birth weight or other measurements at birth or you can measure a number of things in the cord blood subsequently of course this baby grows postnatally the environment continues to act on the baby affects its growth development and differentiation by additional epigenetic factors and finally in later life we are able to measure risk factors morbidity or premature mortality so this is an ongoing iterative program across the life course but the most prominent epigenomic changes what we call reprogramming happens in utero and especially around periconceptional period how did this theory come forth this came because of single man's efforts that's david barker who happens to be my guru my mentor he came and met me in february 1991 and when as a diabetologist i was trying to find larger birth weight babies being at a higher risk of diabetes he showed me the preprint of his paper which was going to be published in bmj in a couple of months time and what he showed in that cohort in hertfordshire near london was that lower birth weight 
was a risk factor for glucose intolerance. Lower the birth weight, higher the risk of diabetes by the time you become 65 year old. So that you can see if your birth weight was less than 5.5 pounds in the cohort which is studied in Hertfordshire, the risk was almost 40%. Risk was only 10% if the birth weight was more than 9.5 pounds. So four times increased risk if birth weight was less than 5.5 pounds. And when he told me this, being a diabetologist and being trained to think that diabetes results from thrifty genes, I told him, David, call your theory thrifty phenotype. So I suggested him this name, Thrifty Phenotype, which he published in 1992. And he called type two diabetes as the outcome of the fetus and early infant having to be nutritionally thrifty. Why thrifty? Because nutritional support was less from the mother. So mother was undernourished in some way. There was a fetal undernutrition and that made the fetus thrifty the result of which he paid later in the life by increased risk of diabetes, not only diabetes, but blood pressure, heart disease, so many other things, but this is regarding diabetes. So this was known to the veterinary scientists in 1930s. This is a famous paper from Walter and Hammond in 1938, where he mated a Yorkshire horse, which are all tall and hefty, with a Shetland pony, which is quite small. And what you are seeing here in picture is father and daughter. So the daughter is very much like mother, not like the father. Even though genetically, father has passed on his genetics, mother has passed on his genetics, but the smaller mother has produced a smaller offspring. And this is epigenetic. It works through how the genes work. And that working of the genes is more important than the structural elements of the gene. And as I told you, various epigenetic mechanisms are now being investigated. So Dohad, therefore, is about epigenetic reprogramming. And this is the additional modifiable, uh, modifiable susceptibility other than the genetics, which is what we started with. And the word programming was coined by scientists in the UK. And what is programming? So normally, if there is plentiful of nutrition, plentiful of blood supply, adequate uterine size, adequate size of the pelvis, then the fetus is grow or is able to grow to the size which is its hereditary potential. But if there is any adversity, it restricts this potential, which we call plasticity. So plasticity is a multi-potential phenomenon. But if you have an adversity that is restricted and that restriction is called programming and that programming manifests in the structure and function of the developing system. So it may be a small baby, it might have a weak pancreas, weak liver, small number of nephrons in the kidney, a whole lot of things. There are windows of vulnerability during intrauterine growth when this process is very strong. And in other words, we can convert them into windows of opportunity. The strongest window is pre and periconceptional period. So woman doesn't even know she is pregnant at that time. And therefore preconceptional approach is very important. This is a community problem, not a clinic problem. Many clinics have converted this into business. We want to be aware that we need to go out to community and use the standard methods of education, public engagement, 
public health approaches to nutrition, public health approaches to reducing pollution, a lot of other things which will allow us to tackle this problem. Other windows are throughout the pregnancy, lactation, adolescence, and therefore it's an ongoing process. We want to improve the environment of the society so that the programming is less and less, but the prime responsibility is during the intrauterine time because that time the fetus is entirely dependent on the mother for this. As I said, there are genetic and related epigenetic mechanisms. The exposures can be nutrition, metabolism, stress, pollutants, etc. It can be multi-generational, quite frustrating. And I will show you later how. So that what we start today might benefit generations to come, not only the generation which is going to be born immediately, but their offspring. And therefore it becomes a very powerful mechanism. And here you can see these in pictures like this person here is shaping the earth into a vessel. And that is how the fetus will be shaped into a good or a, like say, phenotype, which will be either good or which is challenged. And brain, of course, is a center of all these phenomena. So that brain is conserved during evolution. So everything, if something goes wrong, brain is protected. And therefore we have every reason to put in efforts so that brain and the body both are protected. So role of micronutrients in this. So that was about dohad. This is a background to why we are talking about micronutrients in pregnancy. So I'll start with neural tube defects because that is something which is well known and it's one of the great successes of micronutrient supplementation. So a lot of research had suggested in 1970s and 80s that dietary factors, maternal nutrition, or rather lack of nutrition or nutritional deficiency was contributing to increased risk of neural tube defects. So MRC vitamin study was the first such study to reduce, try and reduce recurrence of NTDs in mothers who had given birth to one child with NTD. And what they did was they supplemented folic acid with and without micronutrients to the mothers who had history of NTD in a previous pregnancy and they were control groups. What they showed was that the relative risk was reduced by 80% there was a 80% reduction in the incidence of NTDs in the mothers which had received folic acid. This was a recurrence of NTD. A brilliant trial was done in Hungary, out in the community for the first occurrence NTD. And their supplementation included 12 vitamins including four micrograms of B12, 0.8 mg of folic acid, four minerals and three trace elements. And what did they find? In these 2000 vitamin group pregnancies, there was no neural tube defect. While in the other group, large group, there was 0.3%. What was another interesting finding was other congenital anomalies were also reduced. So it highlighted the importance of maternal micronutrient nutrition from before pregnancy in reducing congenital anomalies in the fetus, primarily neural tube defect, but also other. Remember this dose of 4 mg folic acid is for recurrence of NTD. Here the dose was 0.8 mg. Now the official dose advised is 0.4 mg, 400 micrograms. And we will see the importance of this later in the talk. We have done, though I am a diabetes unit, 
we have done one of the largest neural tube defect study in the world four centers from india pune madras dr suresh ahmedabad and uh, hyderabad what we did was we studied over 300 pregnancies with neural tube defect to find out maternal deficiencies of vitamins and what did we find total b12 levels were similar in the two groups controls and cases folate was similar though a little bit less not significantly what was low was holo tc some of you perhaps know what is holo tc holo tc is the active vitamin b12 that was lower in the mothers of babies who were born with neural tube defects and homocysteine which is a metabolite which is increased in b12 and folate deficiency was higher in these mothers and b12 therefore appears to be more strongly related with npd in the population which we studied in india now how do you prove that this was significant how was it causal you go to genetics so we studied maternal genetics and showed that it was the snps related to b12 transcobalamin 2 which were deranged in the mother of the babies who had developed neural tube defect the folate related snps in our study were not related that's not to say that folate or not important it's just that the national programs are probably providing enough folate and the obstetricians are probably given giving even a folic acid but b12 is the culprit in large number of cases then we will come to another model i am a diabetes specialist diabetes is a non communicable disease like blood pressure heart disease etc and i have spent last 30 years studying dohad model and micronutrients in susceptibility to diabetes this picture very nice i have taken from worldmapper.org which is a very interesting site and it publishes what are called cartograms so cartograms are world maps where size of the country is not the geographical area but the burden of that condition so india is very fat for diabetes we know that india is even fatter for undernutrition at young age low birth weight and under five undernutrition india is world's undoubted capital of early life undernutrition and it's paradoxical that it's also a capital of diabetes and david barker solved our dilemma by telling us that small babies are precursors to future diabetes and therefore we link this with mother and baby diet and possibly role of micronutrients like iron b12 vitamin d folate etc proteins etc so nutrition in general so we set up this study which is now quite famous across the world called pune maternal nutrition study pmns for short this was in collaboration with david barker and his colleague caroline fall who continues to collaborate with us very vigorously even today so we set up in 1993 went to six villages near pune identified 2675 women who were married but not pregnant we followed them every month for their menstrual history every 3 months for their body size measurements 814 became pregnant during study we studied them intensively during pregnancy on nutrition metabolism we studied fathers we studied baby by ultrasound this is 1994 to 96 770 babies were born in the study we measured them in detail at birth 
then we measured them every six months for 18 years. And after 18 years, we measure them every year. And every six years, whole family is studied for their size, body composition, nutrition, cardiometabolic risk factors, oral glucose tolerance test, cognition, whatnot. Follow-up rates, above 95%. World's first preconceptional birth cohort with more than 90% follow-up rate. So people cannot challenge us on many things. And we have a biobank, which I started in 1993 for this study. We have collected serial samples, biological samples for laboratory measurements and for various genetic and epigenetic measurements. So what did we find? The mother was 42 kg to begin pregnancy with 18.1 kg very thin, undernourished by WHO criteria. Babies were born, which were 2.7 kg. 70% of them were small for gestational age. And this mother was physically very active. Like you can see, she's seven months pregnant. She's herself 47 kg, but carrying these two pails of water. These babies, which are much smaller than an average English baby born in Southampton in David Barker's hospital. We showed that that baby had more fat than the English baby. And this is where I called it thin fat Indian baby. I knew about thin fat Indian adults. I now showed that Indians start their life as a thin fat baby. And we were able to show that maternal micronutrient rich intake like green leafy vegetables, milk and uh, fruit were strongly related to baby size, less the intake, smaller the baby. Maternal red cell folate was strongly related to baby's birth weight. And maternal high homocysteine was associated with intrauterine growth restriction. And where did this homocysteine come from? Two out of three mothers were B12 deficient. Folate deficiency practically non-existent, homocysteine high in one third mothers, and MMA, a specific marker for B12 high in 90% of the mothers. So in this one slide, it tells you the genesis of thin fat Indian baby. It has excess fat at birth. You know it is going to be at higher risk of diabetes in future. So we follow these babies. At six years, we made another stunning observation. Higher maternal folate in pregnancy was associated with higher adiposity in the baby. Higher folate, higher adiposity at six years. And we recently showed it at 18 years by doing an MRI and the exam. And very interestingly, mothers who had a low B12, but high folate, their babies were more insulin resistant. So high folate, higher adiposity, low B12, high folate, higher insulin resistance two major risk factors for future diabetes. Additionally, effects on brain development, which we are now studying by MRI, functional and structural, and adiposity. So you have a gamut of increased risk for future non-communicable disease, including different systems. So I have to tell you a little bit about folate and B12 because I see people know only bites of it. So folate is of animal, oh, sorry, sorry, vegetable origin. That's why I called it green. B12 is of animal origin, red. So vegetable origin, therefore deficiency predominantly in non-vegetarians of very low socioeconomic status. It's affected by cooking, so you have to be careful. Recommended dietary allowance, 50 to 600 micrograms per day. 
absorption is quite liberal and it increases homocysteine if folate levels are low. In practice, we use folic acid or folinic acid. I will tell you what is the difference. B12 is ultimately made only by microbes in the nature. We entirely depend on microbes for B12 supply. Animals eat microbes and provide it to us through meat, eggs, fish, liver. So that's how it's a non-vegetarian component. Milk, which is again a source of B12, again is a non-vegetarian product. Deficiency is therefore higher in vegetarians and those who have higher socioeconomic status and are very hygienic are at higher risk of B12 deficiency because they kill all the bacteria around them. So it's a very paradoxical situation. I would really like to see whether hand washing in COVID times increases B12 deficiency. Vegetarians who are not taking supplements, quite possible. It's not affected by cooking. The dose requirement is quite small. Its absorption is tightly regulated as we learned as medical students. And it increases homocysteine and methyl malonic acid. And in clinical practice, we use it as cyanocobalamin. Folate is not same as folic acid. Folate is the natural product. It's a PG, a teroyl glutamic acid, multiple glutamic residues. Folic acid is synthetic. It is a teroyl monoglutamate. It's in the oxidized state. So liver has to reduce it to be metabolically active. And if you have a metabolic defect, which does not activate it, free folic acid can circulate in the blood. And that has higher affinity towards the folate receptors. So it prevents normal folate from acting. It's a very complex situation. And this has been a focus of a lot of research recently. And last month I gave a talk at the FASEP meeting on this. And there is an editorial in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition on this. So in India, what is the situation? We are multi-generationally vegetarian. Unlike the Westerners who become vegetarian when they start becoming ethical, they don't want to kill the animals. We learned it from Samrat Ashok when he became Buddha's disciple two and a half thousand years ago because of the ahimsa, not killing the animals for food. Three religions support it. And as I told you, higher education, higher income, and better hygiene are risk factors for B12 deficiency. Folate from diet, vegetarian adequate food intake would give you enough folic acid, uh, enough folate. Better socioeconomic status, better status in unlike B12. National Anemia Prophylaxis Program provides iron and folic acid. And obstetricians give very high dose folic acid. And that's why I wanted to remind you that the MRC trial was for recurrence of, folate, recurrence of NTD. And they use 4MG. Our tablet in market, Folvite, is 5MG and obstetricians think more the better. So they give up to one to three tablets. Many times after the woman's neural tube or child's neural tube has closed because it closes by 28 days of gestation, we keep giving high dose folic acid. In a B12 deficient population, we produce iatrogenic imbalance between B12 and folate. And I have shown you what that might be associated with. So it brings us to what is called one carbon metabolism. This is a metabolic network in the body related to transfer of methyl group. There are at least 80 transferases in the body, which means it's very central to the metabolic actions. 
very importantly it's required for dna methylation which is epigenetic change lipid methylation which is required for various membrane phenomena protein methylation required for various metabolic process so that is how it's a centrally important metabolism and the or uh, dietary items which control it are b12 folate b6 b2 choline and b10 and it affects all these processes like i said dna synthesis repair methylation genomic stability protein synthesis and with help from ccmb we showed that vitamin b12 supplementation actually modified methylation of genes which are known to be linked with diabetes so quite an interesting thing so pregnancy is therefore an experience for the two not only for the mother but also for the baby there is one situation where it becomes an experience for the three this is a dramatic example so this is a woman pregnant with a female child a female child gets all its 1 million ova by 20 weeks of gestation and they remain with her for the rest of her life so a pregnancy with a female child means there are three generations at a time and therefore you have a unique opportunity to intervene to improve intergenerational health and again for one carbon metabolism peri conceptional period is very important because gametogenesis fertilization implantation embryogenesis placentation all are affected by methylation reactions finally i am going to say there are many other micronutrients we could go on vitamin a iodine vitamin c vitamin d iron omega 3 fatty acids continues to so this is a chapter we wrote for a textbook about vitamins and programming of non communicable disease you are free to actually read it and i floated a theory called the nutrient mediated teratogenesis for b12 folate saying it's important for neural tube defects and other congenital effects various organ growth in the baby and manifesting in different physiology or adult pathology finally i'm going to show you something quite interesting when i showed this slide of three in one pregnancy in one of the meetings in europe a very senior lady came to me she happened to be the dean for the medical faculty in a university in poland and she was quite intrigued by this ovarian idea that a female child had all its ova by 20 weeks of gestation and what she said is in polish yajnik means ovary so that is quite a remarkable thing so i always show this slide as my closing slide that that's how we have got interested in this then i'm going to advertise a bit recently we have made a very nice film to spread the message of maternal nutrition as initially it was stressed that natural micronutrient supply is important this is a film which says that message you are very welcome to see this on the youtube and it's a very nice film made with help from dr sumitra bhave and mohan agashe a very noted sort of actor from pune so i'm going to stop there and i think i have told you how micronutrients are important for the health of the baby not in the short term but in the long term and for outcomes which you otherwise would not relate with this that is non communicable disease thank you wonderful rubik uh, uh, said this has been a fantastic speech fantastic uh, learning session for all of us present here we learned quite a lot quite a lot um i think uh, uh, 
before we start taking questions on your lecture, sir, uh, can I invite all the panel members? Therefore, your questions also could be included in the panel discussion. Would that be fine, sir? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I would uh, I would take uh, thank you very much. I would just uh, take a minute. Uh, I will uh, introduce the esteemed uh, other panelists. We have already uh, uh, introduced Professor Yadnik. So I would just take a minute uh, to introduce other very distinguished panelists here. I take great pleasure, first of all, to uh, before we get started, to uh, invite uh, Dr. Bakul Parikh. Dr. Bakul Parikh is, um, um, is a very eminent pediatrician, uh, extremely well known across the nation. He is also the president of Indian Association of Pediatrics. That's why I was saying in the initial uh, uh, opening talk itself that you know, today is a very special day that we have two mightiest leaders, uh, the president of Indian, Asso Indian Medical Association and the Indian Association of Pediatrics are there. Dr. Parikh uh, is, a, is, a, is a pediatrician from Mumbai University and has, and has been a very active, uh, very active both in the practice, both in the academic side. He's been, he's the Dean of um, uh, BPCH uh, Hospital Multispeciality. He's, uh, he's also professor of pediatrics. Uh, he had been, uh, you know, a person who has been very strong in intensive care, both in the PICU and the NICU, and has a special interest in general pediatrics, infectious disease, neonatology, and intensive care. We take great pleasure, sir. He's a versatile personality. You can as you see here, he's a cricketer, he's a tabla player. So you, you really have amazing personality here. Wonderful to know you, sir, and welcome you here in the panel. Uh, so this is Dr. Uh, uh, Parik. And um, I would take uh, a minute to introduce uh, Professor Radhakrishnan again, who needs uh, not much, much of introduction. Dr. Radhakrishnan again is a very senior person, medical scientist. He's also a pediatrician, but went into, uh, from practice, he went into uh, medical research primarily. And he has been with, uh, he's been a consultant. Uh, he's now the consultant in uh, National Institute of Nutrition, Tata Center. ICMR uh, NIN uh, team, and he has numerous publications, and he has done a lot of work on home-based psychosocial intervention in uh, very low birth weight infants. He has done a lot of work on zinc supplementation. He has done work on anthropometric data of um, body composition, cord blood insulins, and work on that. He's done work on calcium food supplementation. He's done work on abdominal adiposity and diabetes in children. So he has a numerous, again, he has a lot of varied interest and he has also studied the role of probiotics in children, uh, in, uh, in children as well as in childhood obesity. So we typically have a researcher and a clinician. We have a clinician, core clinician and a president policy holder, policy maker uh, for pediatrics, uh, Professor um, Parikh. Uh, and we have Rajiv, Raj, Rajesh Tandon. Rajesh Tandon is again a thought leader. Rajesh Tandon, Rajiv Tandon. I, I don't know whether he's still there. Uh, Amit, is he there? Or is, he wanted to leave early. But I would uh, go on he to introduce to Rajiv. He left. He wanted to leave a bit early. Uh, but Dr. Yeah, yeah. Brooke, he has left, right? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, I'll just introduce, he was to have participated in this. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Tendon is again a thought leader. Uh, he's a person whom we depend on for his thought leadership on various public health uh, issues. And he's part of uh, a lot of activities on the neglected diseases in India uh, and the tropical diseases, uh, which is very special to uh, the countries which are developing like us. Uh, he's uh, he's a, again a, a global uh, renowned, globally well known personality associated with the UNICEF, uh, Nagel University, and lots of uh, global universities and the agencies, health agencies across. So with this, uh, this is the richest panel I could think of. Uh, so with that, you know, let me get started. Uh, first question, uh, Doctor. Uh, uh, Dr. Yadnik, I think it is it is related to your uh, uh, um, uh, 
um, presentation. So I would just, uh, this is from a Malaysian doctor from Malaysia. Um, he says, uh, can Professor Yadnik uh, explain how the graphs shown in syndrome X and thrifty phenotype relate to each other? He feels that, you know, there's a very, may, maybe a small difference. He just wants to know that. Uh, Professor Yadnik. Can you repeat the question, thrifty phenotype? Uh, he says uh, the uh, the difference between syndrome X and thrifty uh, phenotype graphs. Yeah. Right. He's, he seems to be not very clear about that. So he's... Sure. Uh, Can he's I show that again? From Malaysia. Yeah, he needs, he wants you to show that if it's possible. Okay, so this was, you must remember 1991 when it was called syndrome X. Today we call it metabolic syndrome and definitions have also changed. So what these two graphs are showing, IGT is impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes. So that is high glucose, which is in the blue bars. That shows the incidence of diabetes was lower in those who had larger birth weight. And on the syndrome X side, again, it shows same thing, that those who had larger birth weight had a lower incidence of syndrome X. The figures are obviously going to be different. There are less people with syndrome X than with diabetes, obviously. And that is what it is showing. So I don't know whether this has explained your query if not, just ask again, because that's what these graphs are showing. Yes, in case you have further questions, you know, I, at the end of the session, I will send you my email ID. You can send it across and we will have the questions yeah. uh, answered in that email ID. Yeah, very happy to set up a dialogue. Please do send. Fantastic, sir. Fantastic, sir. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, there is also another question. What would be a, a good... Uh, reasonable supplementation in the periconceptional time as an intervention? What are the uh, key constituents? So key constituents are, I think, adequate food, adequate macronutrients, and adequate micronutrients. It's never going to be one capsule of A, B, or C. It's going to be a nutrition which is built up over a period of time and therefore adequate weight, adequate metabolism, adequate nutrition, less of stress. That is the, what should I say, concoction for a healthy pregnancy. Healthy pregnancy. Those of you who are interested Please read a Lancet Commission in 2018 on preconceptional health. There are three articles. We are authors on two of them. And that summarizes the whole evidence about preconceptional health of the mother as an important phenomenon. And again, I will repeat, it's good health of the mother, which includes everything. Nutrition is one aspect. And nutrition is also global nutrition, macronutrient, micronutrient, good quality food, adequate physical activity, adequate metabolism, adequate pelvic size, ultimately, because otherwise baby cannot grow big. So that is the recipe for a preconceptional environment. Excellent. I think that, that, uh, that sums up. Yeah, but one thing I will say, probably it will come later on. We have been doing gross, like say over treatment only with folic acid. Okay. And that I think needs to be balanced with adequate supply of B12, especially for vegetarians and in populations which are known to be deficient, which is vegetarian Indians. In other population, vegans or people with gastrointestinal problems, but balancing folic acid intake by B12 is important. And 
the need for larger dose folic acid like 5 mg is only in very select cases where there has been a previous problem of fetal congenital anomaly especially neural tube defect otherwise 0.5 mg of folic acid at the most 1 mg per day is enough with adequate b12 intake which unfortunately the tablets in the market are again very high dose daily requirement of b12 is 2 to 3 micrograms for deficient people it may be a little bit more so no need to give anything more than 10 to 15 micrograms there are many tablets on market of methyl cobalamin which are 500 1500 it's not necessary for this situation excellent excellent so um, um while on the same topic quickly uh, this uh, talk on this l methyl folate as being superior to folic acid do you do you subscribe to that thinking sir yes see if you take adequate b12 mm -hmm. then folic acid is methylated okay. so you don't need methyl folic acid mm -hmm. you have a balanced intake of b12 and folic acid and that should be enough and as i again said the natural folate in adequate amount is also really important so green leafy vegetables fruit adequate intake of cereals and go to the website and find out folate containing foods you will be able to then have enough supply no need for any fancy molecules fantastic that i think that's a that's a very good take home message uh i have a question for um uh, uh dr parik um dr parik do you uh, how do you look at the problem of childhood obesity in these days uh, and uh, yeah what are your thoughts sir yeah childhood obesity is definitely on rise especially in the cities now we always talk of malnutrition and malnutrition where people go for those junk food and that has caused this particular epidemic of sort in obesity in children and usually in iap we define we initially used to believe on bmi uh, uh, findings but now we definitely go more on uh, 23rd equivalent or 22nd equivalent related uh, rather than the bmi charts and that's how we define either overweight or obesity and we also know that obesity is always related and associated with micronutrient deficiencies and also vitamin d deficiencies so all those things we have to consider together and because of this more of junk food and both the parents working and they want to keep child happy and even adolescents are more towards this so that's why we have come out with junk guidelines junk food guidelines we have labeled junk guidelines which is published in indian pediatrics it is showing various ways and means of how this junk food is eaten and how it can be prevented what problems it can cause and which how it can tackle it so i think that's about obesity and uh, uh, basically the most important part is that we should track bmi from right from the birth because uh, at birth usually it is 13 then it increases to 17 by the age of 1 year and there is a dip between 18.5 to 23 years and that dip is very important so now it is that deep is missing and that is not a very good uh, sign and it's a very great risk factor for obesity to occur in this particular child and of course now because lots of premature babies are being survived so there is something called as barkers theory so nutrition during uh, that period can later on lead to various metabolic problems like obesity diabetes and others which dr jadnik has really touched upon very nicely i was really enthralled to listen to dr jadnik i must appreciate his talk he has covered up the topic so very well about ncds because today morning only we had a talk on ncd we have established a ncd chapter in iap because 71% of the population is suffering from ncds now instead of communicable disease we have to concentrate more on ncd and uh, they are all basically metabolic diseases cancer hypertension and so on and mental health problems so and probably it is more seen in the middle income and low income group so 
so developing countries are more affected and in india we, we know that our health sector is really poorly managed so we have to really come out with the preventive strategies rather than treating this type of patients so with these two points i think we have to consider our obesity more and more and on nsd is more and more thank you very much sir wonderful sir wonderful uh, uh, dr radhakrishnan would you like to add a few points here in terms of you know uh, have you seen any uh, mineral like interventions and um, um, anything on the infant uh, um, i mean supplementation of not not for the infants i'm talking about uh, overall the childhood age group any mineral intervention has had any kind of an effect on obesity in your research experience we have not seen any such experiences with some micronutrient or mineral supplementation reducing obesity or reducing diabetes or anything as dr agnik already mentioned it is more important that right from preconception or preconception age how the micronutrient environment and other environment is maintained which is responsible for these epigenetics and all other things and of course postnatally also it's a type of diet actually right from complementary foods it is most often the high sugar high fat high salt diets for various reasons either convenient foods or whatever it is which give relatively more empty calories than supplying most of the micronutrients if the diet is wholesome and then if there is no energy excess and if you have a good quality protein added with the uh, enough physical activity actually the energy intakes which have relatively increased in most of the groups either because of the soft drinks or convenient foods or high fructose sugar drinks and other things should be equally accompanied with physical activity for building up the lean body mass and reducing the body fat actually without these things whatever energy even the protein which is not of good quality will not be utilized for body building or muscle mass building so all these things will ultimately enter into say, energy balance and it will be transferred to fat deposition etc which will ultimately result in obesity and metabolic syndrome include dyslipidemia etc and all those things so it's a wholesome diet actually you should get sufficient amount of fruits vegetables which actually should form almost 40 to 50% of your total food intake so then only you can get most of these nutrients micro macro in good balance and there is no need for any supplementation so that's what uh, i uh, this is this is wonderful uh, my, uh, just one point uh, you know since taking the advantage of Pro professor yadnik presence dr parik presence and dr jailal presence and radha krishnas i mean all of you are uh, you know some of you are all playing a, a very key role in policy making for the government or you could definitely do uh, a tremendous role there so i uh, talking about this childhood obesity how i mean we all recognize that how big it is and how important for all of us join together to evolve some strategies for it and uh, what is the level of awareness and is it easy to create that awareness or what are the hurdles and how do we intend to overcome i would rather uh, start from dr parik and take that to you know maybe i could take a, a point from dr professor jailal too and then um, dr radha krishnan and then you know, dr yadnik can sum up yeah. so uh, dr parik yeah. from an iib perspective or from a pediatric perspective so start with uh, let me tell that national nutrition survey which was done in 2016 and 18 it was an eye opener they said that nutrition is the single best intervention to tackle the triple burden of malnutrition mal nutrition or underweight and overweight and undernutrition and micronutrient that is hidden under so that is very important that we have to definitely try and give proper nutrition now at iip level we always suggest to counsel mothers on childhood obesity non acceptance or lack of awareness of uh, diet or nutrition which is to be done for the child and we should address it on war footing and maintaining a growth chart and having a weighing machine at home can really help in a big way the image that fits like uh, acanthes is my guns psychological issues bullying micronutrient deficiencies anemia lack of stamina motivation all these things can be highlighted and also they can be explained them that 
later on hypertension hyper cholesterol metabolic syndrome all those things type 2 diabetes all this can be prevented if we really take care of nutrition so that part of counseling is very very important then of course i at iap we have also done lots of initiatives in terms of program called as nap basically we have two arms of iap which we are utilizing to take the advantage and that is one is your outreach and third, third second is the credib credibility you know and uh, so basically as we know that all pediatricians are very busy in their practice and they don't have time to really counsel well for the nutrition and they don't take nutrition as an illness and until and unless you take it as an illness and treat them on work from then only uh, they will be able to convince the parents and uh, get the good nutrition done so we have uh, using our uh, sort of rich liver we are uh, we are uh, we have started the pilot just last week in thane district where we are trying to prescribe the supplements uh, in not the uh, processed food or but the whole food and mother must have cultural family and kitchen friendly whole food solutions which are going to last long and can be sustained and mother and entire family will be happy so iap started with a nap solution n n a p that is the call as no like um, a pilot program which is basically to make people aware and make food available which is reasonably charged because if you look at it the carbohydrates starch in terms of wheat and rice that is easily available to pds scheme and uh, there is a green revolution in india so now we don't have that problem but protein is the one which is going to be very costly and fruits and vegetables are very costly a lower middle class or a poor family cannot afford that so we have to find a large scale solution to cover up this particular problem and that has been done iap has already done a, a solution for that by utilizing the nuts when the oil is removed and the leaves which are all Uh, safety certified uh, by fssai and uh, that can be used along with uh, things like lal kichdi and that will take care of your midday meal and other foods which are otherwise becoming very difficult even for akshay patra because of lakhs donation and government can spend only 5 and 1/2 rupees for that particular midday meal but it is costing 11 rupees so that's that's what we have started with our pilot program and if it is going to be successful it is going to lead to a national solution and i think counseling concentrating on the whole food rather than avoiding processed food and putting in supplements will be very important and education education and education and make people aware will make some change that is my stake superb sir superb sir professor jailal would you like to uh, um, give some thoughts on how ima could possibly be uh, collaborating on this initiative of you know this childhood obesity and looking at the menace of childhood thank you and uh, i think this is a very important concept which we are thinking but uh, so far uh, in ima perspective we have a motto of anemia free india that is the one concept where we are talking on now then and we have a mission pink health where we are talking on adolescent health we are uh, important on the various issues of adolescent and uh, to my uh, mean uh, we have not done much on the childhood obesity and of uh, the prenatal uh, uh, management of the obesity I mean prenatal of uh, the epigenicity the concept which uh, ajnik has very well explained on that issue uh, but, uh, yes definitely that ima will encourage our uh, branches to concentrate on that the con the topic the diabetes is a one term which always we talk to our uh, branches to uh, emphasize not in their own routine uh, meetings also to concentrate on that uh, nutrition value Uh, but there is something more on that issue on the uh, nutrition when we cannot uh, now generalize the statement on this issue whatever we talk on that uh, we have seen uh, in general the people who eat a uh, rich carbohydrate rich protein and rich fat they do not develop any kind of the problem and we have seen the babies are born in the streets babies are born to the people also do not have the diabetes and the nutrition playing role Uh, something more than that is also playing on that uh, part it is uh, just like that what we say uh, a bullet uh, with one liter of petrol can for 80 km another vehicle will go for a 40 km it so depends upon the the carburetor i mean the the machine which is functioning so something more the in vitro and in vivo the studies are not uh, collaborating very much so we, we uh, but uh, as a whole uh, the social responsibility concept and ima 
is uh, very well uh, accepting the concept of this uh, uh, prenatal micronutrients need and the role it is developing on the diabetes. Uh, uh, probably, Elil uh, sir, you can give a, a, a program or a, a plan of action. Uh, we will be definitely uh, able to interact on that because now the slogan, which is very fast, what we are promoting is anemia free India and mission pink health. So the, the diabetes concept and the prenatal micronutrient concept also. And if you can uh, chart out your program and uh, work it out, I, I'm sure we can implement in the national level and go ahead. I'm so happy to see that uh, Dr. Bakil has been able to see the experimentally we are doing the, the, uh, the uh, pilot program in Pane. But this kind of, uh, this is important only when we do uh, some pilot study which has a concrete evidence on the uh, social sector, we will be able to implement in the national level. So I will be happy if uh, Dr. Bakil sir can share that uh, your outcome uh, to Indian Medical Association. So we will be also ready to uh, incorporate that in our protocols and we'll be able to make it uh, in uh, national centers. Sir, thank you, Dr. Jalal. I'm really happy that IMA is trying to join and with IAP because our pilot has just started. I'm very, very, very sure that it will be successful. We have joined hands with NSDL. Okay. NSDL, and they have given us tech support and financial support. And there are two or three NGOs who are giving us manpower. And our IAPs and all the healthcare workers in Talu Kalpes are joining hands. So initially, we are doing the survey with some red flag signs, which are very simple to not using certain criteria. And we'll find out exactly what they're suffering from. And then we are using this leaves powder and the left of the sopola and peanut powder, which are very easy and cheaply available, reasonably priced. And we have worked out that it will be less than five and a half rupees meal for a midday meal. So we'll be utilizing it in the urban slum and in the underprivileged children and for the midday meal. And we'll come out with a very good uh, report, I'm sure, within the next three or four yeah. months. So next year, and plus we are having a DIAP platform, if you've heard of it. Yes, yes. The digital platform of IAP, where I am the chief executive officer, it's my dream project. We have done 1,700 webinars and more than 2 million people have touched upon. We are reaching everyone, every corner of the uh, country, and that has increased our reach for taking up of these programs also forward. So I'm very happy that we'll be joining hands with them. That is my promise. And if IMA IP joins hands, I'm sure our country will have a national solution. Definitely, sir. We will be definitely this, uh, you know. I'm very happy to hear your that. Concert, we will be an aggressively <laughs> participant. Yes, sir. Thank this you. Is a great you. outcome, sir. Great outcome. Yeah. Uh, we will definitely spearhead, uh, sir. We will, uh, we will, uh, we will do that. Uh, Professor Radhakrishnan, now, would you like to give some socio-economic perspectives to it, and then I want to have a sum up from Professor uh, Yadnik. So, from Dr. Radhakrishnan. No, I think Yagnik is going to sum up again. But uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Jayalal. What he said, there is no single nutrient or to establish a cause-effect relationship for this. And simply, we cannot find a single bullet. But taking cue from Dr. Yagnik's presentation shows we have a massive problem of undernutrition, which is related to the maternal malnutrition. So which shows that what the mother eats immediately translates to the baby and then Later, we are finding these overweight obesity problems, which are now increasing. But still, we have a big problem of undernutrition in children, low birth weight, preterm deliveries to tackle first. If you tackle those things, I think we'll be able to address half of the question for even later overweight obesity or diabetes imagery. Apart from these things, as Dr. Parikh has said, we need to do at the education, knowledge, attitudes, practices, and all these things to decrease the malnutrition from addressing the malnutrition and also increasing the physical activity, which is much more important now because most of the schools do not have any place for physical activity or anything. And most of them nowadays, they are more like a convenient and luxury type of schools. And this is adding to the problem of excess energy intake, excess sugar, fat intake, coupled with less activity and less energy expenditure. And of course, the hidden anger or micronutrient malnutrition, which is also coexisting. But I think uh, Dr. Agnik is the best person to sum up. And Dr. Agnik is one that uh, Ganesh, Bal Ganesh was lying on supine and with using four mouths really depicts the present scenario. Fantastic. 
Dr. Yadnik, uh, from a from a overall perspective, from you know, you have heard IAP president talking, you heard the IMA president talking, you have heard the medical researcher like you from NIN talking. So, uh, for, and we all know that there is a big socioeconomic impact to it. So, can you sort of sum up how this could be made into a social initiative by all of us together here? Okay, I mean, I'm going to give a scientist social attitude. Aspect. Yes. I sat on the WHO committee, which was called ECHO, Ending Childhood Obesity in 2016. There's a very good report, which is published. It's a huge report, but get the executive summary. It's on WHO website. So that actually summarizes the multi-pronged attack, which we could do. What I'm going to say is that certain things which need to be remembered while doing this, if one is people use the word obesity and adiposity interchangeably. And I was the first one to stand against it 25 years ago because we showed that Indians had a lower BMI but higher adiposity. So obesity is weight for height. Adiposity is body fat percent. And you can look at me. You know perhaps my famous picture in Lancet that though I look very thin, I have very huge body fat percent. Therefore, in all the evaluation of the programs, whether it is done by NIN, other scientific groups, IPA, or IAP, sorry, IMA, measure the relevant outcomes. That's very important. Second is I got late because I was listening to HPS Sajdev for his NFI oration. And that got delayed at that, that end. That's why I was delayed. And he and Anura Kurpad have done beautiful work to show that our approach to treatment of SAM, MAM, and malnutrition in general is going overboard. We are over treating. And if you read my paper in 1999, it makes a very important point. The title is Born Small or Later Big. What is important? And that big is being big in relationship to yourself. So if you are born low birth weight, then becoming normal is also becoming overweight. Now, this is a conundrum which is very difficult to sell to the pediatricians and to the parents especially because they want to see their child normal. And that normal itself is the beginning of the problem of future. Now, this is a very difficult concept to digest socially. And this is where education is very important and therefore, all the programs which are done, including what IAP is doing in Thane or what IMA might be doing, other proper scientific evaluation is very important. And that evaluation usually stops at non-invasive, simple measurements. We need to do relevant measurements. I have just now put out a paper. It's being considered in high impact journals, but I've put it out on med review. It summarizes the findings in Pune maternal nutrition study, which I told you about. Glucose intolerance at 18 years of age. At 18 years of age, the average BMI of these boys and girls was 19 kg per meter square. 50% of them were underweight by the WHO BMI criteria of 18.5. 30% of them were glucose intolerant. 37% in boys, 18% in girls. So what your eyes see, the metabolism is not reflected in that. And therefore, it is very important to make a relevant measure. The next stunning finding there, because we have studied them serially, 
those who had high glucose at 18 years had high glucose at 12 years and had high glucose at 6 years that means the process had started very early in life unfortunately we hadn't taken their blood before 6 years of age but at 6 years we have now modeled a predictive model of their fasting glucose how much percentage pre diabetes it is able to predict at 18 years and i was looking to interact with iap and i am very happy that dr bakul parekh is here yeah so we will interact on this and see how it can work in different parts of india and i am trying to actually push this as an app so we prepare an app which the pediatricians will be able to use in their clinic by measuring height weight and body composition that's body fat and measuring glucose in a child and that would be a very good indication for future risk of adiposity and glucose intolerance what we are calling diabetes so such efforts are necessary then third issue is about double burden of malnutrition double of burden of malnutrition can be in a country so we can say in india large population is very poor and there are largest number of millionaires large population is undernourished and there are substantial obesity in the affluent in the cities that is the double burden in the nation double burden can be in a community double burden can be in a life course you are born small therefore your brain remains hungry it eats after you are born and if we even feed a little bit more they tend to become adipose within one lifetime you had under nutrition in utero over nutrition later in the life therefore we must always look at the past before we want to achieve a good future i did a 3 years visiting professorship with danish diabetes academy i went to a place which is a place where the famous philosopher soren kierkegaard was born and there is a memorial and he wrote one sentence which is just amazing in all of my talks i show it today i didn't show it he said life can only be understood backwards as doctors we want to take past history to educate ourselves about the current condition and future past history of a community is a big determinant of its future steve jobs said same thing you can connect the dots in the past and then hope best for the future so i think in all this we need to keep only yesterday i gave a vishwanathan oration in rssdi and it was called malnutrition and diabetes epidemic in india and i link these two more strongly for that audience and i think therefore on the social side our past history our traditions our conventional diets are important considerations to take health from to improve our future last month nin and tata sampanna did a online symposium i was part of it and one aspect of it was again about traditional foods and these things and someone asked me ki eating oats and olive oil is it good for our system i don't know maybe it is maybe it is not and that's why we need to find that out with relevant measurements and finally in one of the papers we have written we have said the model which applies to this is capacity load model those who were low birth weight have a low capacity of the system they cannot tolerate extra load in the postnatal life all the current programs in not only in our country all across the world are loading people with low capacity because that is the humanitarian approach to famines 
and disasters. And while you cannot challenge it in the short term because it becomes very emotional, that is the beginning of the problem for future. And therefore, we would have to devise ready to use foods, etc., which will provide enough nutrition, quality nutrition, rather than the excess calories and fats. Lumpy peanut story, well known in NCAP. They fed their school children adequate diet as a midday meal. They had an epidemic of childhood obesity. So I think I'm putting on warnings and the red flags to say that balanced nutrition, taking the past into account and being aware of our increased risk of non-communicable disease in future is central to planning. And this is almost never done. We always look at very limited sort of tubular vision and we all work in different silos. We don't come together to combine. It was only David Barker who told us, I told him that you connected the ground floor of the fourth floor of Sassoon Hospital. Ground floor, I was the registrar to professor of medicine running the diabetes clinic. Fourth floor was the labor room where Sassoon Hospital was delivering 10 to 15 low birth weight babies every day. This was going on ever since the hospital started. I never connected it. No one else connected it. David Barker comes on February 1991. And in one second, I realized what was the problem. So I think my a bit of philosophical view is that we need a multi-pronged approach. We need different experts to come together different silos to cross the boundaries, seamless, that's the word, and quality and tradition being central to the intervention rather than going after fancy foods. Couldn't have so been said better. I have just one, one question to Dr. Yajnik, sir. I mean, I fully agree with you. But at the age of 18, if you are uh, making the history that uh, he would have been a diabetic uh, or a gestational diabetic, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we pre-diabetic in the age of six. Uh, do you think it is preventable? Yes. Now that prevention can only be secondary prevention for the generation which is born. Yes, that's but what. But for the future, for the future generations, future generation you, can. you can think of primary prevention, and the new term which came out of Doha that's called primordial prevention. Primordial prevention is intergenerational. It may take more than one generation to act, but they will help, uh, they will thank us after we are long gone. This is, so like, this is, this is uh, very shocking that uh, once you are born with this, you know, it's, start, it's starting with a secondary prevention. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, we appreciate, sir. Uh, that's a fantastic uh, take home message that we need to collaborate. And I'm so glad that we have, in this one meeting, we have uh, you and uh, the, the two big team leaders, you know, the, the people who can really make a big impact. And uh, Amit Srivastava, who can also make an impact from the industry side and, you know, from the, uh, not only from the industry side, from the overall policy side. I think we, we have the right kind of panel, Dr. Radha Krishna, again, as a kind of policy uh, making a side from a science perspective. I think together, uh, if we as a follow-up, if you are able to come out with some guidelines for the general practitioners, guidelines for the pediatricians, uh, some kind of a dot, which, is, uh, which would be uh, practically implementable in a clinic side, in a practical uh, situation, uh, is something that we could uh, work on as a follow-up to it, uh, because, you know, this uh, issue is a problem. In fact, last meeting when we had, there was a person who was, uh, there was a pediat gynecologist who was talking about Miss Polly. Yearly menarche is another issue. And then uh, uh, children getting, you know, menarche at the age of eight and seven. So there are a lot of things that we talked about. 
So I think there's a need for collaboration. I think collaborate, collaborate, educate, educate, educate is the kind of a thing that is emerging out very clearly. We will soon follow up this uh, under your leadership, sir. Uh, if you could uh, spare us some time, uh, I would uh, request Dr. Bakul to recruit uh, someone uh, and uh, under Professor uh, Jailal's leadership, we will definitely take some leadership from an IMA perspective and uh, from Amit's leadership, I would definitely take some perspective on the nutritional side. Um, myself and Dr. Radhakrishnan, I, I would like to have a collaboration with to come out with some kind of a guideline for uh, the general practitioners and for the pediatricians who are out in the rural market and because of the obesity and you know, adiposity is not a matter of uh, metro cities. So with that, uh, I would like to, we are running short of, we, are, we have already exit, exceeded our time. So I would like to thank uh, every panelist present here and the participants uh, for this wonderful insight, searching questions. I hand over the session back to Amit. Amit, please. So before you. Amit takes, I like to pass a few comments. Yes. First of all, Dr. Jadnik was amazing. Yep. Really amazing. No word other than that. Secondly, I would like to know, let you know that HPS Sadev is in our committee for this particular nutrition program, which is going on and is guiding us is like utilizing the wholesale food, no processed food, and so on and so forth. And also we have termed by Dr. Ambedekar that thin fat Indian, thin fat Indian. So that uh, definitely addresses everything in that particular uh, terminology. Okay. So yes, the few words, I'm, I really still, I'm amazed the way Dr. Yadnik has presented. Thank you very much, sir. Fantastic. Thank you. And I think we can even use today's proceedings uh, for spreading it in the two organizations which we have hmm. to many, many sort of stakeholders. Yeah. And I'm quite happy to do such sessions for both the organizations. So I will, in fact, I, will, I have written down here. Yeah, so I will, I will, so I will okay. definitely contact you for our webinars in, on NCDs and others. And if you don't yeah. mind, if you can share your today's presentation, I can put it in my NCD committee and can come Absolutely, out. Absolutely, no problem. Just write to me. I'll yeah. immediately share it. I don't have your I, email I ID, but I can numbers. get it from Dr. We will, we will coordinate, sir. We will coordinate. What number if you have, I will get it from uh, Dr. S. And then send fine, it fine. to you with my email address. Yeah. Yes, and Dr. Yeah. Ramesh Poddar is very much part of our SNEA. Yeah, so Ramesh Poddar and Dr. Almira Fernandez. Almeida, correct. So Ramesh Almeida, we are all yeah. pioneer so, members of Sneha. So I am also part of Sneha, by the way. And in Ghatkopar, right. the project which was running in Vaishali Nagar and others, yeah. it was my hospital where they, had, they were meeting and doing the things. Wonderful. Right. Yeah. I will now hand over the session to Amit for his conclusions. Sure. And thank you very much. You know, first of all, it's been an amazing session. And congrats to Dr. S.J. Larison for getting the best out of the top of the line panelists. You know, I've seen, I attend many seminars with medical doctors, leaders in the medical field, and sometimes moderators make the session boring. So, I mean, you did a great job, Dr. Arasan, and you got the best out of the best doctors in India. Uh, I see an opportunity of nutrifying your route for collaborating with Dr. Yasnik, Dr. Jailal, and Dr. Bakul Parik in building programs for building India as a responsible nutrition hub. And we would like to collaborate, collaborate offline to see how we can do it because we have been doing it. We have had decent success. And if we collaborate, we can only go faster. Dr. Yajnik, uh, I have something interesting which we'd like to talk offline is we would like to collaborate. So we have been trying to do a lot of convergence. You know, on one side, there's information technology. So we are working with a lot of artificial intelligence innovators who are working on uh, on projects related to you know uh, geotagging of personalized nutrition uh, we would like to use their expertise in uh, in merging your uh, work that you are trying to develop in app and see how how superior we can bring this uh, project that could have far more uh, value addition to the practicing uh, professional in medicine uh, the journey has begun and look forward to taking this uh, relation forward. We will be happy to converse the government 
industry, innovators, investors, we too can go ahead and invest uh, on interesting projects and consumer opinion leaders too in the journey if needed. Thank you very much for your time and have a great weekend ahead. Thank you. And I also thank, thank Dr. You. Jamilal, the IMA president, for giving me an offer to join ENS together. I'm sure it will go a great way. So I will request you to share with us all the phone numbers and email addresses of the panelists so that we can communicate offline. Yeah, thank you. Sure, sir. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for taking part, uh, Professor Jailal, Professor Bapu Parekh, Professor Radha Krishnan, and not the least, not the last, uh, Professor Yadnik. We would want you again and again and again. And so we, have, we want to hear more from you from all the association's perspectives, uh, because, you know, this is a very, very pressing issue for all of us. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye. And wish you a happy new year. We may not meet maybe in December. So for okay, all, you know, we same meet. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. COVID free year. I will say COVID free year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.